All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Wine, Women, and Words. I'm Michelle, and of course, with me is Hello. Diana. Hello. And this evening, we have a special guest. We have author uh, Suzanne Belfi, uh, who wrote, who has published her first novel, The Path of Lucas, um, which is based on a true story. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. Hi, thank you. And where, where are you, I should know this, but where are you located? You're in Ontario, right? Yeah, Eastern Ontario. Okay. So and you it's are, Ontario, Canada, not Ontario, California, <laughs> just to be specific. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you're East Coast time, right? Or yeah, it's 11 o'clock right now for me. Okay, see, I'm an hour behind you, so I'm... I, right there with you right now <laughs> <laughs> and I'm in LA so of course it's still fairly early for me yeah you you never you never get to complain about it being late <laughs> no, no I don't <laughs> one day I'll be back in California again and we'll do a broadcast together and it'll be like oh what are we gonna do after this <laughs> <laughs> so um Susan Suzanne joins us this evening to again talk about her book and we were Diane and I were texting each other back and forth about uh, your novel earlier tonight um, kind of getting ready for the show and one of the things that I always think of think is interesting about books that are based on a true story is figuring out how to streamline you know how to pick and choose what to include in the story because it, you know writing a book is different than calling up your girlfriend and telling them what happened during your day. You have to kind of mold the events to make it a readable story. So what was your process when you just, when you decided to sit down and, and write your story, how did you follow the timeline and decide what you wanted to include? Well, I always had a love of books and I always had in my heart to write one but I never knew what topic to write about, right? That's mm -hmm. always the problem from writing a book. And um, one day I was sitting beside my dad and I just looked him in the eye and I said, oh, now I know what I want to write about. Because my dad had a hard life, um, and, but he's always was such a strong man. He never gave up. And so I knew that I wanted to write about him. And I... Um the the story between Lucas and Isabel is just you don't really come across love stories like that anymore uh, real life love stories at least um, mm -hmm. I feel like so it's really it's really nice to to hear you know these real life love stories and get to know these people that you know meet and fall in love I I think that's really nice when people decide to share those stories and, and write a book about them. Yes. Um, I love the fact that my dad, he's, he always was a man that stays strong um, because, like you know, in the book, there was a lot of heartaches, right? Mm -hmm. And um, he never gave up. And so he's, he's my hero. Mm -hmm. That's why I want to write about him. And what did he say when he when you told him that you were writing your book about him? He was he was so excited. His book about me. I could just, I still remember those words. But <laughs> the sad part is um, when my book was getting published, he passed away. Oh. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> But it, I mean, it's still at least you know a good legacy and a good way to remember him. And then, and it's almost like he's living on because you've got the story so that we all can experience it. Um, was there anything in particular that he wasn't thrilled about you including, or was he just like, just go ahead and throw in anything you want? Yeah, he was pretty open about it because um, I know, like, I, in the in the book, there's my mom had depression, right? Mm -hmm. And like at the, there's a point in, in at the hospital that the doctors said there's nothing else they can do. They want to give up on her, and my dad didn't. So you know, like he did, he did everything possible to keep his his wife from 
going in deeper depression and becoming come back to us as a mom so that was like we, we talked about that me and him um, when I was writing my book and because uh, a lot of people don't talk about depression and when I was growing up I was about eight nine years old when my mom took her depression and so it wasn't talked about in the family and I told my dad that I want to open up to this and he was willing to open up to that so he was telling me a lot what was going on was there anything that you learned about your parents that you may not have realized you know when you're a child and you're growing up you don't necessarily see everything but when you hear stories as an adult um, you know you kind of see them in a, in a new light did you learn anything about your parents writing this and going through the process um, I, I like again I felt the love they had so that's why I really impressed it in the book because um, I mean for all they went through and the loss of my brother at 21 of cancer and they still stay strong together, you know, like, so for me, for my marriage, I really want to work on that, you know what I mean, to keep marriage together, to stay strong and to keep the love alive. Yeah, yeah one of the good. reasons why we ended up um, having you on, because we have, you know, the themes and stuff to go along with our um, books of the month, and one of the reasons why um, we chose to do Path of Lucas this month, along with, um, our other book, our book of uh, the book of speculation, which we'll talk about later, um, is that mental illness uh, trait with the um, with a parent, because you you know we've talked about it, and we've seen it in other books with, um, you know, with uh, I'm forgetting the book that we read in April. Michelle, that had it in there. Dear Ruth, or do your thing with love. That was June. I'm thinking of April. Oh, April. Zelda. Yeah. Um, the good, no, I want to say the good earth, but uh, yes, on earth, <laughs> yes, on earth. Thank you. Um, you know, we've looked at mental illness and literature through the person's eyes, like the, from the parent to child, and from the, technically from the child's perspective, but not from this perspective of somebody being a parent, or like in the book of speculation, it's from child to parent. Um, I'm just kind of curious about what your experience was because you talked about the depression. Did you guys as a kid know what was going on? Is that something that you guys kind of, even though it wasn't really talked about, did you kind of know or? I know, um, like, like I said, we were young, so it was basically mom was sick mm -hmm. and uh, she's in the hospital and the doctors are getting her better. That's all we really knew as a child. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. Mental illness, uh, just the care and the talk about it has come a long way in your suit, but it still has a lot farther to go. Um, so I think books like this are great to have in general um, because of that. This way, you know, it can help further our conversations. And I think people have a much easier time, you know, topics that, that may, you know, like, mental illness like depression that can be difficult for some people to talk about in and of themselves but people can talk about books all day so if you have a book that discusses a topic that is a little difficult to grapple by itself you can kind of find that middle ground in a book and say well you know have you read this book it's a really great book and it does talk about this and it kind of gives you like a a gateway, a foothold into that topic, and it helps ease the person into the conversation by discussing, you know, the characters, and then it'll kind of open them up to a, a topic that before they may have been a little nervous about. So I, I think, you know, stories like this, you know, not only does it give faces to the to the problem or to the to the issue, it helps people talk about it more easily. Have, you, have exactly. you found that? Yeah, exactly. Because when I start opening up about what the book is about, I hear a lot of people say, my mom had a depression, my, my brother, my sister, my husband, my wife. So I've heard a lot. Or myself, you know, they'll say, I went through a depression. So yeah, it is great. And we, we sit, we talk. So they get to talk about it. 
And have you, were you able to do a book tour in, um, in Ontario in your area when the book came out to meet people face to face and, and have these conversations? Yes, I did. And I also went to New York City. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. That's where I really opened up. What was the whole experience like doing the book tour for your first novel? Exciting, nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Very nervous. <laughs> and do you, um, did you do a lot of, I know some authors, they do readings or they just do kind of a question and answer session. What was your um, approach to your book tours when, when you were going through it? Um, I also went to a couple of libraries and I talked about my book. Um, like I said, like New York was my biggest one. I toured around on Ontario, but just local. Mm -hmm. And where in New York did you go? Uh, Manhattan. Lucky. I would love to go to Manhattan <laughs> on a book tour, especially if it was my book tour. It was very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> It's been forever. I think I was a teenager the last time I was in New York City. And the husband and I keep talking about possibly going back at some point. It is cool. <laughs> Out of curiosity, yeah. what was your favorite thing there? Was there something that stood out? Totally in New York City? City? Oh, there's so much. <laughs> <laughs> Great restaurants. <laughs> oh. Yeah, yeah there's so, I mean, that's going to be expected for New York. Um, I do have one other uh, like structure question for you on the book itself. I mean, as Michelle mentioned, asked about, you know, questions about stringing together, um, you know, real life inspiration and things of that nature. Um, you know, instead of like putting it down in, okay, this happened and this happened and like what, you know, most people would expect in like a, as a nonfiction story to be put out there in a way where, um, like you would expect nonfiction. This is this reads like obviously a novel because I mean, obviously it's kind of you know somewhat historical fiction. I would, one would say, um, putting in the the dialogue for everybody was that something that was a challenge for you? I mean, I'm sure some no, of it was exact. Some of it may have been made up. Oh yeah, some could be exact, but a lot was made up because I. Again, I was only eight, nine years old and my mom took a depression, so I really don't know exactly what words they said. But talking with my dad, I kind of got what he had to say and then I put it into words. Was there any kind of, um, with putting in those words, was it kind of, was there a challenge with that, especially like trying to maybe, like getting into your mother's head on the, on the subject? Was that a challenge? Was it hard for you? What was that experience? No, Actually, it was pretty, that part was pretty easy because um, as I grew up, my mom and I, we talked a lot about her depression. Mm -hmm. So we were very, very close. As, as a daughter, I was very close to my mom. And so I can remember things she said, so we put it, I put it together, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. She was very open to me about it. That's great. That's great that she was very open. Did you have any more questions, Michelle? I did, and as as you were saying your question, I was like, ooh, that's a good question. I have to remember it. Hold on, it'll come back. Um, <laughs> and no, it's not coming back. Um, I did have a question um, while, I, while I try to remember that. Um, I love that you included the butterflies um, on the cover, and then throughout the novel, they're you know on each page, and in the little breaks of the story. Um, I thought that was a really nice way to include um, your brother through the whole story. Um, even after you, even after he passed away in real life and then in, in the story, I really liked that. But um, I think the cover is beautiful. The photo, how did you, um, how, what's the process? I always wonder what the process is for picking the cover of a book. Well, that was pretty cool. Um, the story goes like this. That picture is a picture of my oldest son, believe it or not. He bought a piece of land and I had my cell phone on and he was walking his path and uh, path of Lucas, right? I said, Andre, hold on, let me take a picture. 
so I did. I stopped that picture. And my other son, my youngest son, he's the one who edited the whole thing and included the butterfly and everything. Wow. Is how much, uh, you know, kids are able to know with computers now? I'm really... Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's now I'm all, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay, because now I'm writing my second novel, and it's going to be about my mom's depression, like her speaking out. And that's going to be a really good topic because people will be able to read it and understand more about what she was going through. Mm -hmm. And what's something that you, that you want people to take away when, once they've read, um, once they read your stories and they've, you know, learned your, your parents' stories, what's one, something that you hope they take away from it? I want them to learn the power of love. Um, how to stay strong and not to give up and if you are going through a depression to open up to someone a friend or uh, professional help or whatever it is to, so that you don't go into deep depression like my mom did you know try to help people out there to to understand and also other people who don't really know what's going on in people's head about depression you know what I mean like some People don't know, they don't want to talk about it, it's, it's taboo or whatever, you know. Open up so you don't feel guilty or you don't feel shame because you're not feeling like normal inside, right? Yeah, I think it's really easy and for, for people who aren't going through it, for people who are on the outside, it's mm -hmm. easy to, to see someone who may be going through something, something real and something difficult and think, Oh, they're just having a bad day, or they're you know they're antisocial or whatever, and just, just kind of get some sunshine off. and yeah. yeah. So like, there, are, I don't know if any if either of you have seen um, with the lead singer of Lincoln Park, Chester Benningfield, uh, his wife released a video. It was taken about it was taken in the afternoon, the day that he died, and it was him just having a good time with the family and laughing playing a game with the kids. And then that evening they found him after he had committed suicide. And mm -hmm. you know, he was somebody who had long suffered from depression. So, yeah. You know. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So that's why you want them to open up, you know? Mm -hmm. And also for, you know, the people on the other side of it, if, you know, we're so busy all the time, we're, and we're always in a hurry that we don't always really listen to what people are saying so if we learn to talk about this a little bit more maybe other people will become more aware and in tune to recognizing like maybe this person just really needs to talk like instead of asking how are you and you know waiting for a simple like I'm okay and moving on like really asking how are you you know because that that may be the opening that someone is waiting for to say, well, you know, this is bothering me or this is going on or I need help. And, you know, maybe we just aren't giving people the opening that they need. Exactly. Yes. And also see, like, you know, someone um, is crying a lot or someone who's not eating or, you know, there's, there's always those um, things you got to look at to see what's going on in that person. And I can imagine that the changes are pretty subtle. It's not, you know, one day someone's fine and then the next day they're not. It's, a, I would imagine, I could be wrong, but I would imagine it's a pretty subtle change that slowly, you know, mm -hmm. they kind of sink into it. So it may not be overnight that, you know, all of a sudden they're just not eating, not talking, not interacting, but, you know, picking up on that. Is, is really important. Yeah, because like for my mom, as a child, I remember her uh, working and then coming home and being always tired. So she was always going to bed and, and you, could, you could tell that she was crying too because her eyes were always red and all that. So, you know, but then my dad was gone to work during the week and so he didn't see what was going on. But as a child, you'd seen it, but you didn't know what to do, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a lot of pressure for a child to 
to be under to know that something's wrong but not know what what to do about it or how to how to deal with it yes so i i couldn't i i wouldn't know what to do in that situation either i can imagine that was a really difficult position for you to be in mm -hmm. well like we did know like my mom lost her sister right so she like in our little heads we were we knew she was sad you know so that's what we, we were thinking like you know the mom's crying because she just lost her sister but it just kept on going and going and going non-stop after a while yeah and i mean you're a kid you don't know that you know that it's anything more than that or you know what to do in that situation so that that's just it's a very hard scenario for everyone involved it was yes I think that's about it. But, I mean, you, I was going to say that, you know, even though it was difficult to live through the fact that, you know, you sat down with your dad and asked him about his life and, and his experiences, I mean, that in itself must be therapeutic for both of you to, you know, so I'm sure that helped, you know, even though, everything happened when you were a child to, to talk about it must have felt really good. It was. It put us really close together, too. We were close, but even, it, it bonded us even more, you know, because yeah. we spent a lot of time together before he passed on, too. So that was great. Absolutely. Well, I know uh, we're just about at 30 minutes, so thank you so much for, for joining us. I haven't finished the book all the way. I'm uh, still reading it just because grad school and kids. And, and <laughs> 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 but, um, but we really appreciate your time and coming on to talk to us about this. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Yes. And when you guys get a chance, check out The Path of Lucas. And, and when is, is it your... everywhere, Susan, or? Pardon? Is it available everywhere? Or are there specific places where people should uh, yeah. look for it? Amazon.com, Amazon.ca, Barnes and Nobles, the chapters in Canada. Fantastic. Now everybody knows where to get it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, Thanks. I know it's Thanks late. For joining us. <laughs> so enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. So, Diana. Yes. Um, we are, you're ahead of me now on the book of speculation. I am. Which I'm not happy about. And <laughs> Suzanne, you're welcome if you want to hang out. I know sometimes closing hangouts can be a little tricky. Um, but you're welcome to hang out and chat with us about the book or just listen in. So, don't feel like you have to close out if, if you want to stick around. <laughs> and I just have to say that um, my faces, facial expressions may not have been the most positive, and I want to say that because I was drinking a wine that I had, I figured I'd use up. It's Castillo Clavijo, and apparently I waited too long. Oh, uh, the vinegary? The vinegary, yeah. Wow. Yeah, so um, I'm switching the wine now for the or water now for the rest of the show. Water. I'm not Jesus Christ. Water. I'm just switching. <laughs> <laughs> I found this um, this wine is called Slow Press, hmm. which I totally bought for the name because come on, Slow Press. Um, yeah. And it's actually really good. It's a Chardonnay, but it tastes. Um, really sweet, I, so it, it almost tastes a little Moscato-y, if a Chardonnay yeah. can taste Moscato-y. Yeah. Well, Chardonnay isn't supposed to taste Moscato-y. But it's really sweet. It's a little dry, like it has a dry aftertaste, hmm. but um, Chardonnays, I, I feel like Chardonnays are usually really dry. Um, it's supposed like, to be buttery with a little bit of a, or some with a bit of a crisp. Is this one of those Chardonnays? Is it over oaked or is there like no oak in that one? Okay, so apparently, 
<laughs> there is this thing where with uh, with Chardonnays, the trend is to not oak the Chardonnay because oh. you, U.S. wineries like to over oak their Chardonnays. See, okay. Don't give me that look because this is me sounding smart about wine, okay? <laughs> if I could raise an eyebrow, I would have, but I can't raise one eyebrow. Um, <laughs> well, their Chardonnay is aged in oak barrels for nine months okay. and blends notes of apple and pear with toasted vanilla and a creamy finish. Hmm. Um, I can't speak to the toasted vanilla, but I can definitely speak to the apple and pear. Hmm, lovely. You know, mm. I've actually tried the uh, Target $5 Chardonnay. Oh, how is it? Really good. I walked I, twice now. I deserve an award for this. Twice now, I have walked past the Target wine and not bought a single one. Oh my gosh. They're, I, liked, I like the wines. The $5, Chard the $5 wines are so good. Well, I have to... I have to go back. I'm pretty excited. I'm going into Chicago on Sunday, child free for a whole day. Wow. I'm going with my girlfriend Vanessa. We're taking the train. I'm so excited. How exciting. You're gonna take all sorts of pictures and update Instagram with it because I wanna see all of that. Because I, I need notes for when I come out. I found a tiki bar. I don't know if it's the tiki bar that you guys are talking Is about, it but three I found dots on the dash? No, it's a different one. Ooh. So Are you guys going to go to it? I don't know. I have a whole list of things that, that can't possibly be done in one day. But but you need to keep it on the side so that, you know, we have at least two tiki bars to go to. Absolutely. But we're taking, like, the 7 a.m. train, so we'll get down there at 8, which is just in time for brunch. So we can have, like, champagne brunch and then do whatever we're going to do. I'm excited. Walk around and shop and things oh I'm so excited for you <laughs> so before that let's talk about the book of speculation, book of speculation which by the way if you haven't already we are raffling off a signed copy of the book mm -hmm. yes. um, so and... if you have not subscribed to us yet on YouTube this is a perfect opportunity to do so um, if you go through rafflecopter obviously to get your entry um, you should it should allow you to uh, Get a um, get to Wine Women Awards uh, YouTube page, so you could so can subscribe through them. If you're having problems where it's not showing your entry, just send us a um, a, a picture, a screenshot of you being subscribed, and we'll go ahead and enter you in. So we are technically eleven shy of being able to have our own unique URL. So if you have not subscribed to us. Go ahead and subscribe now. We are not above bribery, obviously. So could and I mean, you guys, if you wanted to, you could like use more than one email address and create YouTube accounts just to subscribe to us. You're a genius. I might do that. <laughs> <laughs> or I might. I don't think Michelle. I don't think my old email address is subscribed. I don't know. <laughs> I'll check. Anyway, um, so I. This I'm like this far. It's it's been rough. All right, grad school. It's I mean it's the it's a lot. Is real guys. The struggle is real. It is, and the kids and everything. So I'm not as far as I would like to be, but I am I mean, at the part. Two chapters ahead. <laughs> Woo go me. So I know Doyle. I'm not a fan of Doyle. By the way, Doyle. Oh, the boyfriend. I dig the boyfriend. Although I, I dig, dig the boyfriend. Okay, okay, okay. I dig the boyfriend. The way one would look at a weirdo and laugh. Sorry, my nose is running and I'm stiffing a lot. Anyway, <laughs> continue. Okay, so you just made me think of a guy. I remember the guy, the sniffer, the serial sniffer? We used to work in the office with this guy who would not stop sniffing. Oh my god, I haven't thought about him in so long. <laughs> Just reminded me of him. And I kid you not, you'd be sitting there, be quiet, be quiet, and then you'd hear. And then be quiet. And, then, and he was really, really bad yeah. about it. And chuck a box of tissues at him and be like, go away. And it was one of those things where he had medication to stop it, but he didn't like to take it. 
yeah wow i haven't thought about him in a and period. it was and it was it was constant um almost to the point where it was a nervous tick so don't feel self-conscious or anything michelle i know now i'm, I'm like sitting here going <laughs> <laughs> but anyway um so you dig the boyfriend do you you I dig think the boyfriend funny i just I, I i mean i wouldn't want him to date my sister but i think he's just kind of like this comedic relief i well the all right so i totally picture and i i'm not don't know if i'm using his name right justin thoreau um yeah jennifer aniston's boyfriend husband yeah. i don't know if i'm married husband. um that's who i picture for I can see that. For Doyle. I can see that. Even but though. Like, he's covered in tattoos. Yeah, I feel like he, he could probably rock that. Um, the, but, the one that he's got, he, I, I mean, I think part of the reason why I like Doyle is because he's got octopus tentacles, like, everywhere. Yeah, I, I knew like you would tentacles. like that. Huh? I knew you would like that. <laughs> it's not like I have a mild obsession with octopuses or anything. But... So I'm going to get super uh, literature on you for a second. Yes, but yes, Professor Michelle. I was walking the dog and the kids today and thinking about the book and like power walking on my stroller and going, I really like how the house is like a metaphor for Simon's life. Yes. Like yes, it's it falling is. apart around him and he doesn't want to fix it but he knows that he has to, so he'll like try to fix like one part of it, like the gutters, he tried to fix the gutters and it didn't work, so he like stopped. Mm -hmm. And now that I'm thinking about it, I'm like every character has something that like represents them, like um, Doyle and his tattoos, like he's like this creepy, slithery guy that like latched on to Enola with all his suction cups. <laughs> <laughs> But that was my literature moment. And that is very true. It is that house is, it's almost a character in and of itself. Yeah, because, and I like that, you know, it's kind of like carried through, through, through the story so far. And I'm sure it will continue to do that. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't just a way to open the book. You know, it mm -hmm. wasn't just, this is a problem, but we're not going to talk about it anymore. It's like mm -hmm. an ongoing thing where, mm -hmm. like, the doors are sealing shut because of the temperature change and the wood warping. Mm -hmm. And he can't get into his room anymore. So, like, does that mean that, like, part of his childhood is blocking off from him? I don't know. See? We're going to have to keep reading to find out. <laughs> This is what I think about when I'm on walks. <laughs> Besides, yeah. like, no, Landon, you can't get down. Lily, please get back in the stroller. Don't throw that on the ground. Pick that back up, please. <laughs> All the while trying to also control uh, how many pound dog? 60, I think. But he's trained now, so he's good. Oh, good. Except I wouldn't, he almost got a squirrel the other day. Like, <laughs> pretty sure the squirrel thought he was going to die. <laughs> Those squirrels, they're vicious. You never know. I would be interested in seeing that just because I think River would, like, freak out if a squirrel started fighting back. <laughs> if a squirrel was running from him and decided, like, you know what? I'm not going to run from this bully. Let me deal with this. And, like, turned around and went after River. I'm pretty sure River would, like, yeah. The other way. Yeah. I my would kid, too, to be my honest. My dogs don't quite, I don't think they know what quite what to do with a cat. <laughs> so get this well, some cats are bigger than them. Huh? Some cats are bigger than them. Some cats are bigger than Lilo. Not necessarily Fizgig, because Fizgig's kind of chubby. She's a curvy girl like her mama. Um, <laughs> 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 um, but there's this cat who'll come by, and we've got this hill, and we've got like this this midway fence and the cattle just come stalking by and it'll sit at the fence and the dogs are just going nuts and it'll just dangle its paw like Doo -doo -doo. like hey there uh, you can't get me 
<laughs> and the dogs are just going nuts and the cat's just having this place like hey, you're stupid oh come and get me have you and, seen yeah, um, i don't know what they would actually do if they actually came across a cat like face to face have you seen the secret life of pets <laughs> yes that's like chloe the cat in that that's what I, i'm picturing right now mm -hmm. but anyway yeah, that's what the neighborhood cat's like um so did we all right so have we cast mr totally forget what his name is mr Chur. it's not churro but that's what i'm coming up with right now are we talking about the guy who runs the um church the way church no room? the um the old man who gave him the book the bookseller oh um no but i do have a picture of somebody in my head um I'm kind of thinking like um, I'm trying to picture his face. He was uh, in the Dark Knight series. He was Alfred, and I love him to death. And Michael Caine. Yes. Yeah. I'm kind of picturing him. Oh, that's, that's a good one. Yeah, I'm just picturing like this older gentleman that's just like can be totally friendly. Who's just this old book nerd. Even like even Gary Oldman, I think, could do a yeah. Mr. Church story. Yeah, yeah. Now, These I was serious thinking questions. Huh? These are serious questions we ponder here at Wine Woman Words. They are. And then was it Mr. Peabody? Um, the but Mr. Peabody, I don't know his name, but the uh, the guy from Moulin Rouge that did the like the, oh, the yeah. owner of the club. That might be good. I was thinking John Cleese. Or that. That works, too. <laughs> I like John Cleese because he's got, he can have that showmanship, and he kind of has that, what was it, that, what do you call it, the joie de vivre <laughs> of uh, somebody who would be leading the freak show. And, all right, so this is, again, another story, kind of like the fortune teller that goes through a bunch of generations. Mm -hmm. of different people um but evangeline is this little scandalous thing who kills grandmothers with wooden spoons yeah now that was a crazy scene and that was interesting the um abuse within religious perspectives because you don't necessarily see that a lot in literature that was yeah that because what, what was her, her daughter's name was Amelia, right? Yeah. And then she died. Mm -hmm. So is that where the curse started? Do we think that the amber colored man was like the devil? I think he was like Merman or something. What's the, what's the, fo the folk tale about, is it like the silkies where yeah. if you like find their, um, their, yeah, right. They, they find their pelts. The pelts, thank you. Down to, down to land. Yes. So, mm -hmm. is there like a male version of a selkie? Probably not. But I think there is. Aren't there both male and female selkies? I don't know. I'm not a fairy expert, so. I can't and imagine there are. Because I can't imagine there would be a folktale about a woman being able to trap a man on on land by finding his pelt it's you know, I, I would, like, I was sure there would be because i mean there are some okay. desperate women out there <laughs> well I mean, usually I'm sure it's like a woman who is she can trap a man by by holding on to his pelt she would keep that under under lock guard that he can never find it and he would have to be hers forever you know there are those women out there true um, I don't know if there are male selkies. Let's see. <laughs> Inquiring minds must know. I have to know. Let's see. There are the Japanese swan maidens. Selkies <clears throat> can be either men or women. <laughs> Told you. Huh. But are seals when they are in the water. Interesting. Yeah. So he could have been a selkie. Or something see, to that effect. You see, we are an educational program here. We, you know, we teach you about these things. We talk about serious subjects like mental health, and we teach you just a little bit about theory folklore. 
and that uh, Chardonnays can be over oaked. FYI. That's why you have me. <laughs> but when you asked me if the wine was over oaked, like, really? <laughs> <laughs> I actually had somebody like sit like basically like I don't want to say trap me in a total wine and more, but uh, cornered me in a total wine and more and was talking to me about that. So that's how I know this knowledge. Like, you and know, then finally, I, was... I have a reason to share it. It does smell a little over oaked. You are right. No, I don't know. I think it's good. <laughs> So this is our second book in a row with tarot cards. And I heard something somewhere, I think my mom actually might have told me this, that you are not supposed to buy, I don't know, it's, it's either you're not supposed to buy your own set of tarot cards. That. You're not supposed to buy your own. Or you're not supposed to keep them in your house. Like you're supposed to keep them somewhere else. But I don't know where else you would keep them. Right? I mean, I have my own set of tarot cards. I mean, obviously, if you guys saw my photo of um, the for the fortune teller, um, I've got these cool like uh, dragon tarot cards. I keep them in my house. I mean, I'm not going to rent a storage unit just for my tarot cards. <laughs> uh, a whole great. unit just for like this little box. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm just going to go check out uh, check out some tarot cards. It's all good. But I kind of want. A, a deck now just and you know a couple years ago before when I was pregnant with Lily mm -hmm. we went to the Outer Banks to hang out with my cousins and one of my cousins had a, a deck of tarot cards and she was like you know she had her little guidebook to read what everything mm -hmm. meant and she did my reading but she said that she didn't want to say it in front of everyone Mm -hmm. He was like, if you want to know, I'll like go into another room with you, but I feel uncomfortable saying this out loud. Mm -hmm. Well, now don't tell me because that's awkward. I don't want to well, know. No, I definitely want to know though too. But I, I didn't know. I didn't ask. I said, okay, never mind then. I don't want to know. Hmm. But stronger than I am because I'd be, I'd want to know. I'd be like even more curious. <laughs> well, I just figure like. That's not set in stone that that stuff's gonna happen, so you can change it. But if you know, it's kind, of, it's like, um, it's like the time traveler's wife yeah. at the end. Like she it's knew that, you know, she knew that her husband was gonna see her sitting in her room, so she spent the rest of her life sitting in her room waiting for her husband to show up again. It's like, and now you know why I did not like the time traveler's wife. It was so sad though. I didn't like the end, but I liked the I book. liked the movie better than the book. I started watching the movie again, and I just, I couldn't watch it. Hmm. But, have we, we haven't cast Amos yet, have we? Amos, no, we haven't. And it's kind of hard to, I mean, cast them, because, I mean, you got to go with the child. And um, by the time he meets, it was Evangeline, Eveline. He's, Evangeline, yeah. Yeah, he's 18. He's an 18 year old at that you point. You know who I totally picture for him, though? Hmm. Atreyu from The Never Ending Story. He may be a bit too old now, but I see where you're going with this. And I, like, I kind of dig it, yeah. Like an older Atreyu, but like Atreyu. <sighs> yeah, yeah, something along those lines. Yeah. I, I, we could go with an unknown for him, <laughs> a newbie, a, a newly discovered. Yeah, Just and, you, you know, and he could have, I mean, some looks like he could have that like Native American blood in him because I mean, there's the traveler, so who knows? They never said the traveler was white, and we never know anything about his father. So, is his father like his father a tra was a traveler? So, we don't know. Well, yeah, but I mean, like, are we gonna find out that he is somehow involved? Like, obviously, he's not gonna be the same like copper hair, copper eyed man because that'd be gross. I'm assuming he and Evangeline get together. I don't know what happens. Do you know what happens? I'm only in chapter 10. I don't know what happens. Okay. <laughs> I'm only two chapters ahead of you. I'm not, I'm, not a, I'm not a fortune teller myself, okay? And stop skipping ahead. I know that's what you're doing right now. 
I'm not. I was looking at the drawings. Yeah, as you're flipping at the back <laughs> of the book, you can look at the drawings in the beginning of the book, Miss. Um, but I and I also really like now that Enola is here, and by the way, I love um, the mom's logic of taking something awful and making it something beautiful, and that's why he she named her Enola. Mm -hmm. So, what do we think Simon came from? What's bad about Simon? Oh, so many things. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, he might not have been something bad. I mean, I mean, if you think about it, he's he's not prone to this curse because, I mean, at, at the end of chapter eight, you see that there is a specific day where the women die. Yep. He, there's that. There's that point. And he has so, ten days to figure it out. Exactly. So she's not worried about him and this curse. He's not the one she's worried about. She's worried about Enola. But do you think she knew it was a curse? I mean, she I she so. was a she was a carnival worker too. She traveled, so she was in that world, mm -hmm. you know. And she she knew like the the folk tales and the myths and everything. So do you think she knew that she was going to die on the twenty fourth? Well, I think so because that's when her mother dies. So I think she had an idea, and I think there's, you know, they talk about in the book where there's this connection, this general like season, and not necessarily a specific date where people um, will die or commit a, you know, suicide or, or whatnot. I mean, I think she knew. I think she was this family trait. Yeah, but so my question is, all right, it's July twenty fourth that they all kill themselves. Mm -hmm. But it's not a year, so how do you know, like, this is the July 24th that you're supposed to do it? Maybe it's by their age. But they all have different ages when they, they died die. young. Yeah, they, young, they, were they all but, different ages? I thought they were roughly the same ages. No, uh, they, were, they were all young. They were all, like, in their 20s, but they were different ages. I think they're all in, in their 20s. His you know, mom maybe might have been. Point, it's like it to a certain point in their life. I don't know. Maybe it's but, like how a dog can predict an earthquake. <laughs> you don't know yet. <laughs> but Enola, the um, sibling rivalry between the two of them. Love it. Is so fun. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I love Enola. Like when she was introducing Doyle and she's like, oh, he is this guy. He drove here to see me. And, and then as she's walking away with him, she's like, by the way, to it. And I'm using Captain America approved language, by the way, so congratulations. I was going to say it, but I was like, <gasps> my mom is probably watching me and I'll get a text message for using foul language, so I'm going to rely on Diana here to, to step in. Because <laughs> your mother hasn't scolded me yet. <laughs> but you've been playing, uh, so, but I didn't want to anger Captain America, so I use proper language. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> but she doesn't say we do it. She uses a more Straightforward, four letter, rhymes the duck. Crack. <laughs> we'll use, we'll use, uh, was it, um, that'll start galactic language. We frack. <laughs> <laughs> Never watched that show, but that's a, a good way of putting it. Mm -hmm. I wasn't a big fan of that show. I watched maybe a few episodes, but I like that word. I don't think I, no, definitely never watched it. It was too military for me. What was the one? There was one, it was like the dome or something. Yeah, I watched was, the first season of that and I couldn't get into the second season. I don't know. Right now I'm reliving Grey's Anatomy and Friends and Madam Secretary on Netflix. Did you see that the new Beauty and the Beast is on Netflix? Yes, I saw that today. It's on my safe list. <laughs> can't wait. It's going to be on my airplane too. So you know what I'll be watching. It's going to be chick flicks all the way to Paris. <laughs> that doesn't count for your chick list. Chick, lick, chick oh, no. movie. Yeah, okay. So what Michelle's referring to is the fact that my husband and I have an agreement. I have to make, I make him watch three chick flicks a year with me. Um, he's watched one so far, which I said Beauty and the Beast, because Beauty and the Beast came out what, this year or last year? It was last year, right? Yeah. This past March. Was you know how I know? 
that's the last time that I've been on a date with my husband was in March. Yeah, we need to fix that. That was six months ago. <sighs> he should have taken you to see Wonder Woman. I'm just saying. If the Navy would let him, like, have a day off. Anyway. They're a party of one. Anyways. <laughs> so, yes, I don't get any rollover. He has to see whichever movies I pick out for him. Uh, no questions asked. Somewhat whining, though. Um, <laughs> it's a good-natured much... whining, though, right? Yeah, yeah. for the most part. I mean, if he, wh he knows that if he whines too much during a film that I'm going to make him watch an even worse one the next time I have Because <laughs> I will use these as penance towards him. Um, so, yeah, no, the, the chick flicks on the plane do not count because I have my own individual screen in front of me that he doesn't have to watch. Oh, so there you go. He now, has this... his own screen. And if he doesn't like seeing what's on my screen, he can just put on his sleep mask and go to sleep. And so does he have, like... Chick flicks and reading, like the two together i'm so jealous that you get like a solid 14 hours of just reading i'm gonna be sleeping for part of that and sleeping and reading and watching a movie <laughs> and it makes you feel better i hate sleeping on planes sleeping on planes is the worst <laughs> I whine like the whole time. Ryan gets so annoyed with me because he just, he's like, I can't get to sleep because I've got you next to me just whining. Because every time I move and I can't get comfortable because you're sitting up like this, basically, and you can't lean back too much. Because um, you don't want to be rude. Exactly. And God, I hope the people in front of me aren't that rude. Um, and so you're kind of like stuck in the sitting up position and you're trying to get comfortable and like your butt falls asleep and then your hip falls asleep and then you just, you can't, it, it's awful. And I've done the trip to Australia where that's like 17 hour flight and then some, cause we were living in Texas at the time. So that was like a full day's journey, full 24 hours travel. And that was not fun at all. Well, you know what I do is I pull down the tray and I put my head down on the tray and that's how I sleep. Really? I might have to try that. It's, it's proven and tested, tested and proven. Hmm. I haven't even finished my glass of wine. Well, whose fault is that? I mean, at least you have a decent glass. I'm going to have to look at this and turn this into actual like vinegar for like salad dressings or something. Well, no, because tomorrow I have, I have a big day tomorrow. Like, I cannot. Fridays are the hardest day of the week for me to wake up because of this right here. I don't know how. <laughs> um, but tomorrow, like, I really need to wake up. And when I need to wake up, then I need to walk the dog and get out of the house on time because I'm doing a thing in the morning, and then I have another thing, and then I have another thing. It's a very busy day. Mm. So I'm going to eat Oreos and drink water after this. Uh, the Oreos because I want them. The water because I can't be hungover tomorrow. <laughs> the Oreos and water sound wonderful, by the way. Yeah, I think so. I think so, um, so next week, everyone. Uh, to finish the book. Yeah, finish the book. That would be helpful. Yeah. Um, we are doing a special date for the episode next week, we are going to be going on Wednesday instead of Thursday. Mm -hmm. And I say this to remind myself just as much as everyone else. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to put it in my planner so I remember. You should. Uh, and we'll have the author, Erica Swyler. Yes. So and we can talk about whether or not the house was a metaphor for Simon's life. Oh, and I hope so. Because, I mean, that's a fantastic idea. And we could talk I about some of, her, some of her ideas, some of her stuff, some of her, um, her casting choices. Yeah. I have I feel like that's probably the most frivolous part of the show, but it's probably it's the most one of fun. The fun part. I mean, knowing what we drink and then, like, actual casting, it's so much fun to cast a book. Because you see the movie in your head. And it must be fun for the authors to like sit there and hear people talk about their 
their book and go, oh, you know what? I think uh, Joseph Gordon, Gor or no, who do we pick for um, Simon? James oh, McAvoy. James McAvoy. James McAvoy would make a good Simon. Who is Enola? BTW. Oh, I was actually thinking again, recast it, doing a cast again of Kenzie Solo. Okay. Because I could kind of see the resemblance. To, you could pull off the sibling thing with her and James. And Enola's got this really slight, petite frame. She looks like this little thing. And, like, the fact when she shows up, she's, like, basically emaciated, like this little waif of a thing. And I think Kenzie could pull it off. Yep, I can see it. Mm -hmm. All right, well, everyone. We'll pictures of some of our casting choices up on Facebook. Yes, yes, we will. Mm hmm and so everyone keep reading. Um, enter the giveaway because it will stay open until next Tuesday, the 25th. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, 26th. I think so. Tuesday, 25th. 25th at midnight. Okay. And um, remember next week, Wednesday instead of Thursday. Yes. Have a good night, everybody. Bye. Bye.